Hey everybody, welcome to our Lunch and Learn today. I'm excited to dive into our topic. Our topic is on how to best engage and develop young talent. This is a topic that's very fascinating right now. I mean, we are in COVID. We've got a lot of different transitions and changes going on with the world. And one thing that I think is easily forgotten is our ability, our willingness, our drive to develop our young talent. I think so often we lean on our more experienced veterans and it's great, by the way, we should be leaning in and on our more experienced veterans. But when it comes to the actual work itself, if we can develop and cultivate our young talent, we can put our business in the best position to thrive and succeed for multiple years moving forward. However, I recognize that sometimes as leaders, as professionals, it can be so easy to get caught up in a short-term focus when we've got a crazy pandemic going on. Fortunately, we've got a great guest with us here today. We've got Mike Sweet. Mike is the founder of a company called Nimbly Wise, where essentially he helps companies develop young talent within their teams. Mike, thanks for being here. Garrett, thank you so much for having me. And that was a great setup. You uh, framed a lot of the issues that we think about and a lot of the issues that we're all grappling with. So it's great to be here. Yeah. So Mike, I love if we could just start off, how did you get into this work? What made you want to start into developing young talent in the first place? I mean, I, I think we see a lot of coaching around revolving around executive coaching, like senior level CEOs and directors and that sort of stuff. Why did you take this counter approach of going straight towards the young talent? Yeah, so I ran a technology company for about 10 years from 2008 to 2018, and we, we got to grow a great team. And that was one of the most satisfying parts of that work was growing the team and developing young talent. And when we sold that business, it was I just thought it would be a really fun challenge to work on, which is to work with young talent, developing young talent as the focus of a new business. So the, my HR director and I paired up to found uh, NimblyWise. And so we work as an education and coaching company around soft skill development. And we focus on young talent because we especially believe that in today's world, coming out of school, you know, having a degree is super important. But then when you come out, there's just so many things that you're thrown into as a young professional that you are not prepared for. And college probably really can't prepare you for. But to then really get an assist or assistance from your company in terms of your development and coaching and outside support can really, really accelerate and your professional development and your career success. So we just see a high leverage point with young professionals. That's really interesting. I, I love your background as being like the founder of a tech startup. When you were the founder of your tech startup, when you were leading that company, what did you do differently? What did you do differently for young talent, for young professionals that one, showed you there was a ton of ROI from investing in your young people and two, helped you accelerate further and faster than the pack? Yeah, that's a great question. So when we were looking at it, we would always think about how can we create an intersection between what we're doing, what we need in terms of skill sets on the team, what a young professional wants to bring and contribute to the team and what, um, what they have skills for. So if we can find something that they're passionate about, we are in need of and that they want or they have the skills to deliver that that's this this really beautiful intersection that we were always working towards so we really felt that you know there's lots of people who believe if you treat your employees well that they'll treat your customers well and so from my point of view it was always about trying to figure out what motivated and engaged the young talent and how could we create an environment that played to their strengths and gave them a pathway towards things that were important to them so with that philosophy we were able to achieve a high a level of cultural engagement and you know, really some strong business success. Yeah. Did you feel like, and I love that, and I don't mean to ever sound like I'm too much of a bean counter over here, but from a bottom line perspective, did you find that people's learning curves or even just the uptick time from being transitioned and trained was faster when you were investing more in your young people? And when they were up to speed, were their, I guess, ability to bring, I guess, positive contribution margin to the co to the organization, the company, was that, was that something that was faster when you would, ex I guess, maybe the question I'm asking is, was there ever a point in time where you didn't spend as much time or money or resources investing in young people versus a time where you did, and you notice a very noticeable difference? in the ROI from investing in young people versus not. Does that question make sense? Yeah, I mean, there are, it's, I always used to feel like there, there were a lot of things that we tried to do to drive engagement and create a good place for people to work so that they would want to stay. 
Um, and so sometimes, you know, when you're growing fast, there's a lot more career opportunity because you, and the company's growing, you need people to develop, there's opportunities for them to grow into new roles. As you start to slow down in your growth, it becomes harder, it becomes more challenging because there's not as many career opportunities. That's just a reality that can be true in big companies, right? So I think for us, we felt that by investing in people, helping them see above the level they were working at in terms of what we were communicating to them about business challenges and opportunities and the strategy of the business, and then how that might translate into opportunities for them. That just helped to advance their professional maturity so that as we did grow, we had more opportunities uh, for them to step into. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That's interesting. I like that. I, I just... I, I guess maybe the question was more around like the perspective of like, okay, have I, have you ever worked in an organization where you felt or ever seen an organization where they just weren't investing in their people? They're like, Hey, we're cool with being a turnover factory. We recognize we're going to get a bunch of people to come in. A lot of those people are going to come right back out. But for those that stay, they might have a chance of, you know, making it, I almost think about it as like the fish egg kind of scenario where it's like, we got a bunch of, we got millions of fish eggs. We know that a lot of them are going to get eaten on the way. But some of them are going to develop into full-fledged tunas, and that's going to be great. I don't, I don't actually know if tunas lay millions of eggs, but it's just a hypothetical scenario that I'm trying to, to put out there. Sometimes some organizations are just kind of going with the law of the numbers versus the, uh, you know, hey, let's treat every single person that we bring in as like a really valuable person that we can really develop and cultivate, which I know sounds really... Uh, I don't know, it might sound very uh, cynical about like the workplace, but some some companies, that's the strategy they go with. I don't know. It's true. Yeah, definitely. It reminds me that when I first started my career, uh, I was working for a company that was a bit like that. It's sort of an assumption that you'd come in for one, two, three years and you'd churn. And the first day of work, one of the people said to me, hey, they found another victim. And uh, I thought that was a little harsh for your first day. So uh, as a matter of fact, within about six or 12 months, I really did see opportunities in that business for a greater emphasis on organizational development, intentional training. I actually helped you know, make a bunch of suggestions. They gave me a chance to pitch to the CEO about how just with a little bit of tweaks, they could make a bigger impact and make onboarding more successful, give themselves a, a stronger high potential talent pipeline and really uh, create more of a draw to, to want to work at that business, right? So I think it comes down to not just retaining people, but attracting people. And if you do get a reputation today with the way the world is, that you don't uh, invest in people, that you are churning them, that there isn't, that fewer and fewer young professionals are going to opt for that, right? They're going to see on your glass door rating that this is a place that makes no investment for that. And if it's a big brand and you just want to go in and make that deal that you put their logo on your, on your resume and you move on and, you know, it can work. But I think increasingly most, most young professionals want more than that. They want to see, they know that companies aren't going to be perfect when it comes to development or even business practices all the time, but they really do notice when you're making a, a real good faith effort and that can go a long way. So by no means of any company I've ever run or been a part of was perfect and, and none will be, but I do think you can tell when the heart and soul of the leadership is invested in this versus when they're just kind of going through the motions. And I think it's today risky strategy as a business if, if you're gonna just sort of fake it and not really make that genuine effort to try to create an environment where people, at least a good percentage have the opportunity to grow and develop. Well, it's so interesting. There are so many good points you just brought up in what you just said there. I'm fascinated in one, the words that we use. So the first thing you said was, oh, we found another victim. That seems like such a harmless thing that said at a bajillion companies. And although it was said in jest, it was said as a joke, that is an awful way to start somebody's relationship. And I feel like that's something that we just kind of let roll off our shoulder. But really as a leader, if we are a leader and we hear somebody say that, in our company, in our organization, that should be something we stamp out immediately. Because if we do that, we are literally setting our team up for failure. We're literally using words that are saying, you are about to not enjoy your experience here. And even if it's said as a joke, that is not, that's not a culture builder. That's a culture killer. And um, that's so, it's so interesting that you brought up that point, but I think it's so often we, uh, we lose sight of that. But to the, your second point about being intentionally focused on building culture and that sort of thing. I don't think a lot of companies set out to say, oh, I'm going to build a bad culture. 
However, I don't necessarily know if as many companies are intentionally set on building a really strong culture where they take time to reflect, audit, and improve because ultimately it's so easy to get uh, caught behind. It's so easy just to kind of go through the motions and just say, hey, I need you to do this task. I need you to do this work or this thing needs to get done or, you know, awesome, we're going to celebrate this person's birthday, but really we need to get this assignment done. It, it's like, what can we do to set a culture that's intentionally focused on, on cultivating talent and cultivating people and helping them feel warm, fuzzy, and welcome and warm inside? Yeah, I, you just raised such a great point. I, what, I worked with a senior leader once on my team and he, he, we were doing some culture building exercise and I certainly don't think we went overboard with what we did. We, we did make it intentional, but it wasn't like every day we were going, you know, two hour uh, big, you know, activities, team building activities. But he said one day, why are we doing, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever it was. He's like, this is the best culture I've ever worked in. Why are we doing more? And I thought that the irony of that, well, because we make these, you know, we're, we're going to err on one side or the other, we're going to err on the next thing. Now, as a counterpoint, you know, I would hear feedback that, oh, the company doesn't do this or the company doesn't do that. So at some point you have to, as a leader, feel inside that you're deeply committed to this, regardless of what people think. People will always think, some people will think you're not doing enough. Some people will think you're doing too much, right? And so you're going to have to decide. I never wanted to err on the side of, of too little, but, um, you know, and I, I think it's one of those things that you just have to continually if you look at the whole employee experience, you have to look at all aspects of what employees are, are experiencing in, in their in your work environment and just try to chip away every day a little bit better. Are you creating clear career pathways for people? Are you creating upward opportunities? Are you, you know, taking time to celebrate wins? Are you giving constructive feedback? You know, there's just a lot that you can be doing. Um, are you bringing in new talent so people can learn from people from the outside? Are you having a healthy amount of turnover so that it doesn't get stagnant in the business, right? There's just a lot of different levers and that's a part of the business that I love. And I, and I really love helping other leaders with that because as you said, it is easy to just get focused on the urgent. We got to get the results. We got to get this project done. We got to do that, right? And that always feels like your hair is on fire and there's never an end to that. But if you don't make time for the important things that are going to shape your culture and your company over the longer term, you can end up with, you know, a fragile foundation that's hard to build on. Mm, that's a really good point. You know, I guess what I'd be curious to know is what do you see as the future of work, especially as it pertains to young professionals? How do you see young professionals shaping and forming the future of work and the future of the way we work? Man, it's, uh, it's going to be really fun the next two decades. I think the next 20 years will be really transformative. I think um, there, and COVID coming in the midst of this has, has accelerated things, has made things aw we're aware of that we weren't aware of before. I think the future of work will be marked by flexibility. It'll be marked by people being, as we know, more freelancers, more independent contractors in a lot of ways, but not in a way that just is a way for companies to take advantage of talent, but in a way that young professionals and professionals in general can meet, make lifestyles that really work for them. They can, they can contribute their greatest gifts, their greatest skills, their talents in environments where they can really have an impact, but in a way that allows them to have a life outside of that. So I believe we're moving in those directions. At the same time, with the pace of change that we have and the, the, the amount of technology enabled business, it's ever more important that we have people that have the institutional knowledge in the business. So the idea that everybody's sort of transactional and in for six month gigs and then out, I think creates some tension. So I feel like the best companies are going to be the ones that can create that flexibility, that freedom, um, that opportunity for young talent, but at the same time retain them. Um, and not and not have this be like, well, you're here for a month or six months and you're just a gig person, because I think the problems that we have to solve as businesses to grow and be successful long term do require strong, high potential talent growth and advancement. They do require um, some level of stability in the business. And so I, I think that's essential that we find a way to balance those two ends of the spectrum. That's really interesting. I think what's really critical it sounds like at least from what i'm hearing it sounds like what will be a very 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 valuable skill is the ability to project future not only revenues profit margins be able to bake in margin based on the work environment 
I think we oftentimes look at, okay, great. How much are we bringing in, let's say as a business and how much are we putting out, whether that be in raw goods, materials, that sort of thing. But our human capital costs, that'll be something that's, I mean, it's already very abundant. I think it'll be even more variable and very, and even more critical that we as leaders understand what's going on. Because essentially, if I'm hearing you right, what, what, what I'm hearing is we may have scenarios where people might not necessarily be working full-time, or maybe they work you know, as a contractor for us because this is what works with their schedule, um, or maybe they're full-time, but they're not working full-time. And like, how do we, how do we adjust compensation so then we're able to provide people with the balance they need, ensure the company's able to earn the margins that they need to earn to be able to exist, um, and just essentially have people feel they're like they're being compensated well enough. I feel like that's like a fine balance because, you know, if I'm a company, if I'm a leader that hears that and I'm thinking to myself, okay, so, all right, now I'm going to look at maybe have to look at, you know, maybe a month and a half of a vacation every single year that I provide to my people. Or maybe I have to start looking at, um, you know, not 40 hour work weeks or not working on Fridays or Thursdays. Um, or maybe I'm going to have to look at creating some additional flexibility, but yet there's going to be this expectation of the salary with the benefits. How do I ensure that as a company, we're still able to make that uh, feasible? Like that's something I feel like has got to be on the top of our minds for us to m- make this all work, right? Like what are the, yeah. what's the thing that's got to give? Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's much easier in small businesses where the senior leadership knows most everybody in the business. But as you try to do that at scale with you know thousands of employees, I think it's incredibly challenging. I think for me, I do believe that there is an increasing expectation that companies and employers will come to their contractors, to their employees and know them not only from a professional standpoint, but also from a personal standpoint and engage in that kind of conversation about what is going to work for them in a very professionally mature way. I think COVID helped create, pull down some of the, the, the barriers between work and, and personal life. So we're more comfortable with that it is, as being more fluid. And I think it will be I mean, I'm lucky because I I can have a lot of those conversations in a small business about what is motivating to you. Is it compensation? Is it upward career path? Is it uh, being able to figure out how to have more time off? And I think, you know, things like unlimited vacation time, if people see that it's just a way to actually trap you to work more hours, because in theory, it's unlimited, but everybody's looking at you when you're taking any time off, like that, that disin- if it is disingenuous is going to be a real problem. So I, I think you've hit your head on your nail on the head of something super important that I think more and more people expect work not to just be a place where I show up and give a certain number of hours a week in exchange for a a set of benefits and some compensation, but a place where I can really grow as an individual, contribute fully, and not have to sacrifice the other aspects of who I am as a human being. And so I think the better companies are able to figure out how to balance that. And I don't believe it will be easy. I think it will be hard, especially companies that are in hyper-competitive industries. You know, the bigger companies that have you know, moats around their businesses, lots of profitability, legacy, you know, successes that they're still trading on have more flexibility to, to do stuff like that. But I, I think the, the smart, smaller companies will, will really be looking for how to embed that in their business models too. So they can attract the true top talent. Um, and that's where I think that's the, that's the win. I think the win is that you're going to be able to win the talent war if you can figure out how to do what you just described. Yeah, it almost seems like it would be beneficial to have almost like layers or levels where it's like, hey, like, what's your commitment level? Like, if you're like, hey, if you're, you're like, hey, I'm going all in, because I mean, one thing that we've seen from the pandemic is some people are taking on two full time jobs where they if they're working remotely, no matter what, they'll work one 40 hour a week job, and then another 40 hour a week job and just combine the salaries together. And that's cool and all and there are benefits and there are perks to all that sort of stuff. And it's fascinating. But it would be interesting if you could say, hey, you know what, if you're going to sign up to do like, let's say the really heavy 70 ish hours a week where you're going to go really hard. This is what the compensation is going to look like. This is what the benefits are going to look like, all that sort of stuff. Um, If you're like, hey, you know, you want to have that balance. You want to be able to earn enough to like achieve your lifestyle. But the expectation is going to be more around 30 hours a week. 
it could be for the exact same role, but you're able to adjust your compensation package based on whatever your expectations are there. But to your point, I, I mean, I don't want to necessarily be all about counting the hours, but I can't think of any other way that you could count the output. I mean, maybe you could count like the actual projects or things delivered. That could be one way, but it's, it seems like a very interesting and relevant point that if, if adjusted could potentially make everybody happier at work because it allows people to work in the way that they want to work. Yeah, you, you raised something that I've always been fascinated by as an economics major. I remember reading about this economist from the early 1900s. He actually came up with the keeping up with the Joneses uh, effect, right? But his, his idea was that by 100 years from when he was alive, that we'd all be working way less. Like his, his theory was, look, you're going to satisfy your basic needs and wants in a relatively short amount of hours. And at that point, you're going to want to trade for leisure time. You're going to, you're going to say, look, so I can have a better car or I can have more time. Well, I'll live with a slightly less good car, but I'll have more time. And so what's interesting, of course, is that we haven't lived into that vision. And if anything, we work more and we're more driven by that. But I, I do think it is really, I think that is the marker of millennials and Gen Zs. They are looking at that. They're looking at intentionally architecting their lives in a way that their work and personal blend more seamlessly, that they make what they need to for the lifestyle they want to support. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And I think that it, it what I've seen when I have people that are contractors uh, working with us is that there's because it works for them, because they've thought about it intentionally, they're, they can be incredibly motivated. They know that if the projects aren't going well, that there will be a, a chance that it won't continue, right? There's not, there's not an assumption of, of security, right? There's just a, hey, and so I, 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 you know, I, gotta, I gotta show up every day and do this and it'll be great. And so I think that's good for everybody because it forces you to really find something that you're gonna be able to pour your heart into and do your best work and be really engaged. And that's, uh, I think that the level of competitiveness in the world, we need more and more of that, more and more people being engaged at every level and contributing to their fullest. So I'm hopeful that that's what will come out of this. I, I think it's a tragedy that, you know, we see over and over again, uh, engagement surveys with people being, you know, only 30% of people being engaged. We see people being hostile in the workforce. We see, right, that's, that's just so tragic um, because it, it you're spending so much time that it would be nice to think you could do something that didn't feel like torture for so many people. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. So I want to dive into back just developing young professionals, because I know that's your area of expertise. What I'd be curious to know is, and I kind of touched on it before, but it, it seems like young professionals are more inclined to leave their roles um, than other people. I'd love to know, is that necessarily a bad thing? I mean, I think so often we think turnover is this bad thing. And if we invest in our people to develop and they leave, it could be a bad thing. I just have heard stories and stories where there's a boomerang scenario where they go, they leave, they go get some more skills, work somewhere else, but they come back because they had such a great experience in the culture of the organization. Um, it almost became analogous to, I don't know, almost like a referral, like just the ability for them to work at the company. They are referring that company back, evidenced by the fact that they came back to work for the company. But I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think absolutely some amount of turnover is abs is, is entirely healthy. I, mm -hmm. I don't think we, I don't think it's realistic to think we could shoot for it to be zero. And I definitely don't think it would be good for businesses if there wasn't more turnover, some amount of turnover, healthy turnover, whether that's 10%, 15%, you know, some amount of voluntary turnover. That being said, I think it's a mistake to say, hey, we're not going to develop because, you know, turnover is not the worst thing. So we're not going to invest there because one, it will hurt your brand externally. Again, going back, I just think that's a really dangerous thing because people do feel that if you aren't investing in them, they do feel frustrated. They do feel irritated. They, they, they will make that known publicly and it will make it harder for you to attract people. Number two, if you're not developing your high potentials and trying to groom them for, for leadership at the very least, that group, you know, you're not, you're going to be hiring from the outside. And while that's good, I think bringing in people at every level from the outside mixes things up, brings new ideas, brings new ways of thinking. Absolutely. But I think there's a real danger if you, if you don't bring promote from within, if you don't have some pathways to the, to advancement and you, and you're just relying on people coming from the outside. And I think if the more you focus on the development of the young people and really grooming them for roles and giving them the opportunities that they seek, the better, 
those often are your better leaders because they have a lot of institutional knowledge. They have a lot of expertise that they've built up in that business. That's very hard for somebody to come in and replicate if they're coming in from the outside. So I, uh, I definitely think that I would never say we should have zero turnover. And in fact, in places I've seen or been a part of that had low, really low turnover, it, it actually can be um, not a great thing. I think that people can get complacent. I think it can get kind of not having many ideas, new ideas, because it's just sort of they've seen people have seen the same problems over and over again. They've kind of worked them to death. And um, I think that 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 can be dangerous. But overall, I love the quote that when a CFO sort of challenges CEOs who want to who want to make this investment and they say, well, what if we invest in these people and they leave? And the CEO is like, well, what if we don't invest in them and then they stay? Right. So you don't want a equation where people who are motivated and really your most aggressive to get ahead feel that only going outside is their only pathway to that you want to you want to challenge those people give them great growth opportunities and and you want to try to do some of that internally but the boomerangs are some of the best stories to tell the rest of your people like hey and and i've had it happen and it, it, nothing boosts morale like wow it must not be the grass must not be that much greener on the other side if this person's back 6 12 18 months later so it's it's I definitely think you shouldn't try to, you should never try to keep people. I always try to tell people, I want to see you grow and develop as far as you can in the organization that I'm leading. But more importantly, I want to see you grow and develop wherever you can. And the idea of trying to hamstring people to keep them there um, just never seemed to me to be a great strategy and never something I wanted to focus on. You brought up this interesting point about promoting from within. I like to dive into that because Oftentimes we hire from outside, especially for management positions, because the skills that make you great within your individual role are not necessarily the skills that make you great as a manager. In your work, do you ever dive into the, the newly minted manager component of that? Because I feel like that's a unique set of skills that is not touched on and is not developed nearly enough. I see so often people are thrown into this middle management role because they were great individual contributors. And the logic behind it is, well, if, if they weren't good at sales, how could the rest of the sales team respect John Doe, sales newly minted manager, um, because he's now in the role and he possessed the management skills that we're looking for. I guess, I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? Like, how, how do you balance the whole individual contributor, not necessarily, that those aren't necessarily the skills that make you a great manager kind you're, of dichotomy? You're, you've... You hit a nail on the head there. Absolutely. How time and again we see that. Oh, they're the number one in their department, whether it's a programmer or a salesperson or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And now let's let's make them a manager. And it does, if it kind of makes some sense, like, okay, you're the top of the class here. Let's make you a manager. But you're absolutely right. It's totally separate skills. And often totally separate skills, right? And I think that what we focus on with one of the reasons we focus on young talent and soft skills is that cultivating those soft skills intentionally at lower and lower levels of an organization is your best path to creating managers that are gonna be very successful, right? Because a lot of times people get promoted because they had expertise and then they get fired because they last, lack the emotional intelligence to really manage people well and to find out what motivates them. And they've, they've always gotten praise for being a great individual producer but now they need to get praise for bringing the team along behind them together, giving the, the victories to their, to their teammates, to the people that work with them. It's a totally different um, mentality. So I, I completely agree in that. And we do see a lot of companies that kind of grow quickly, whether they're 50, 100 person companies, a lot of people have gotten battlefield promotions so that they've like, oh, you know, the person just left above me. Guess what? I get the job, right? And they now they're too late, right? They haven't really done the manager training. They don't have any manager training. They haven't been doing intentional training with their younger professionals so that they're ready. And I, I've seen in my own experience that that can be one of the worst things you can do for for somebody's career right they, everybody's excited great but now you can step into the role i've got somebody there you're getting more money you're getting the title but now the bar went up right and what if you weren't there you know at that bar ready for that 
man, that's just such a, now you've got to oftentimes let the person go if in fact they can't do the job. And that's going back to something you said earlier, the sink or swim. All right, you know, you're the, you're the next man up, next woman up, it's time for you to go and do this. And, and I think that that's uh, a real disservice. So a lot of times when we're developing talent, when we're thinking about it, we're saying, let's make sure we're really, un- really clear what role you're stepping into. Let's have you really doing that role for three, six, eight months. Uh, and as a way to prove a proving ground, and then we'll give you the promotion, then we'll give you the money. And hey, if we have a few false starts on the way to that, no problem, because we haven't sort of publicly announced it, gotten everybody um, geared up for it. And, and, you know, one of the reasons that's important is because when you do step into the manager role, especially if you've been peers to other people, there can be resentment, there can be a sense of why are they getting this and not me, there can be a little bit of a mark on your back. And that's something you don't want to set somebody up for as a leader. So finding that ground where you're, where you're challenging somebody enough so that they can develop and grow, but not setting them up for failure is, is a delicate balance. So you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, I don't think you should always promote from within. I think you should bring from the outside too. I just think you should do as much as you can to make sure people are ready to step into those roles and you've been investing in them intentionally to, to get them ready. Awesome. Mike, this has been a really great lunch and learn. I'd love to just finish off with, um, one, any final closing points you'd like to share with the audience, just about, um, maybe high level best, best, practices for developing young talent and or just any other final points that you'd like to make and then two um, how can our audience learn more about you and connect with you thanks Gary yeah so the way we look at it is really simple we we think there's three really important things that we need to do when it comes to developing young talent number one we really need to meet each individual where they are we can't assume that every young professional has comes in with the same strengths and the strength, same opportunities for growth. So in terms of our development plans and our trainings, we need to find a way to meet them where they are. What challenges are they struggling with? Are they struggling with confidence? Are they struggling with organizational skills? Are they struggling with professional, uh, basic professionalism? Um, wh- how do we really uh, connect with them as an individual? And so with that, we, you know, we think coaching should be a big coaching. Mentoring should be a big part of the equation because it, we think that's a very private thing. You know, most people aren't going to expose where they're struggling with, with their direct manager, unless you have a high degree of trust. So for us, that's an element we think everybody should be thinking about when it comes to developing young talent. Number two, we think that young professionals come in with a lot of sort of experience and expectations that come from the world of school. And we think all of us, even all the way into our career, we think the world of work is going to work like school did. And it just doesn't, right? We didn't have to manage up in the same way to our professors as we do to our managers, right? We, we didn't think about what was going on in my profession, my professor's lives that I needed to keep in mind as I was doing my class. But we need to do that when it comes to being an employee and working for somebody. So we think there's a ton of sort of opportunity for mindset shifts and resetting so that people really understand how do you play this game? We often talk about, you know, school is a lot like checkers. And when you come into the world of work, it's like a chess tournament and it's just very different. So we use that analogy and we really want to help people understand how they need to think about it. A lot of people think that their manager should have all the answers and they, their manager's sitting there with all the answers and they just haven't given them, them to them yet. You know, right? Things, things that we all know once we gain experience are just not true, but can cause a lot of frustration and friction for young professionals and contribute to them turning over. And the third part of what we believe is key is around soft skills. So we really believe an intentional cultivation of the soft skills around communication, teamwork, empathy, diversity, equity, and inclusion, awareness, all of these things need to be cultivated. These are not things that you're going to just send somebody to a two-hour training and they're going to come out and be a master of. So for us, that's a third component that we think young professionals need to have uh, a pathway on. And yeah, we would love to talk in, uh, to anybody that's interested in learning more. They can come to nimblywise.com or find me on LinkedIn. Uh, Mike Sweet uh, is my name again. And I'd uh, love to talk with you. It's been a great conversation, Garrett. I'm super, super thankful for your time and the questions and your interest in this topic. It's uh, really, really appreciated. Yeah, thanks for your time, Mike. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks for being here, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Mike, thank you for being here. Awesome. Thanks, Garrett. Have a great afternoon. Take care.